Today's speakers, uh, I wanted to introduce them uh, to you and you'll hear from each of them uh, in a bit. I first want to introduce um, Dr. Jessica Gosnell. Dr. Gosnell is an endocrine surgeon and a professor in the Department of Surgery. She did her undergrad at Wellesley um, at the University of Washington residency at UCSF um, in the East Bay and then fellowship in endocrine surgery I just learned tonight in Sydney, Australia. So great to have you, Dr. Gosnell. We'll be hearing from you in a bit. Also want to introduce uh, Dr. Lauren Beretta, who is a radiation oncologist here at UCSF and assistant professor with a special focus in the treatment of central nervous system tumors and palliative radiation therapy. Lauren did her medical school and residency at UCSF. So uh, thank you both for being here and we will hear from each of them uh, in just a bit. Um, and I'm Sam Bronfield. I'm a medical oncologist here at UCSF. You all have heard from me before. And uh, I'm one of the chairs of this course, and my co-chair, Dr. Aurora, uh, is not with us tonight, but will, will be with us uh, next week. I also want to reintroduce to you uh, Dr. Spencer Baer, a radiologist at UCSF, and Dr. Neil Newman, a pathologist uh, at UCSF, and we will be um, hearing from them a bit tonight. Thank you both for being here. To briefly summarize the session from last week, um, we covered how there are, diff there are effective screening tests to catch certain cancers early. We, we talked about uh, cancers often present with symptoms based on the cancer's anatomic location in the body. When a cancer is suspected, we discussed how imaging and biopsies are typical next steps. We talked about the term staging, which refers to tests, usually imaging, to help determine how far the cancer has spread. We talked about how testing on a biopsy specimen can identify cancer and suggest possible treatments for it. And if there's one take home point from last week's session, for me, it would be that imaging, biopsy, and molecular testing all play key roles in identifying cancers and in determining the treatment options that people have. For today's session, we're gonna start with this brief intro that I'm doing now. We're gonna hear from Dr. Gosnell a bit about the role of surgery in treating cancer. Then we'll hear from Dr. Beretta about the role of radiation in treating cancer. I'm gonna come back and talk to you a bit about what systemic therapy is and its role in treating cancer. And then we're gonna do a bit of a mock session for you all called a tumor board, which we'll explain when we get there. And lastly, as usual, we'll end with a 20 minute uh, question and answer, including everyone who was here with us tonight. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand uh, the mic over to Dr. Jessica Gosnell to talk to us about surgery. Thank you, Sam, and I'm so delighted to join everyone this evening. And as Sam mentioned, I am an endocrine surgeon. So what I hope to do tonight is to um, give some overview and some context to surgery. I acknowledge that um, certainly the word can be scary and it is um, by its nature invasive, but I hope to um, just give some kind of overview and context, and, and then I'm happy to, to answer questions. Um, I have no financial disclosures to tell you about, but again, I will just make two quick comments. One, surgery is now very specialized. And so what I'm sharing this evening will be through the lens of someone who treats lots of folks with cancer, but I do have that lens of endocrine um, diseases. So um, you'll often hear me hearken back to some of the, the things that I do day to day, which is treating thyroid, parathyroid, and adrenals. Um, my other disclosure is that um, that surgery is invasive, and I have taken special care not to include um, particularly graphic slides. I do acknowledge that, that sometimes these topics can be a bit sensitive. So a brief overview of my talk, I hope to share and impart to all of you some definitions, some indications, and then some trends um, in surgery for cancer care. So just to start with a very uh, interesting uh, definition, surgery is described in the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary as the medical treatment of injuries or diseases that involves cutting open a person's body, often removing or replacing some parts, um, also described as a branch of medicine um, connected with this, um, with treatment 
of major or minor surgery. And my main point in sharing this slide is that surgery is not just an operation. Um, it really is a branch of medicine that involves the preoperative, operative, and postoperative care of patients with operative diseases. So going, going back in time, surgery has been performed since antiquity, and um, it definitely had origins in more of a trade than of a profession. Um, but it has evolved and progressed tremendously over the, especially the last century and a half. Um, advances in anesthesia, uh, antisepsis, and technique, and vigorous training programs um, have all allowed us to progress um, again in the last century. So there are many reasons that patients uh, may need surgical procedures. Um, some of those I've included here. So I'll just briefly go through some of these. Um, relief of obstruction is one of the more common indications for surgery. This is an x-ray of a patient with a small bowel obstruction. And um, you can see just lots of these little loops here that are filled with air. Ordinarily, you would not see that. And that indicates that there's an obstruction kind of downstream from where the, the bowel is. Um, this type of problem can happen either from benign reasons um, like scar tissue or adhesions uh, or from obstructions relating to cancer and tumors. Infection is another common indication for surgery, um, again, that can relate both to benign and occasionally uh, cancer, cancerous diseases. Um, this little diagram here shows an abscess, which by definition is kind of trapped, and then it can be drained and packed. Traumatic bleeding, which is shown here on the screen left, um, just shows um, bleeding, which is controlled with a tourniquet, but then will need surgical control. And then here is an example of a duodenal, an ulcer in the first part of the small intestine um, that is bleeding. And that is, again, a, a situation that occurs somewhat commonly and often requires surgical management. And that, especially for this um, GI bleeding, that can occur again for benign and malignant causes. Surgery can also be done to restore function and or cosmesis. Um, this is an X-ray and a 3D reconstruction showing a abnormality called pectus excavatum, which is basically a skeletal abnormality. And you can see that the bony abnormality can actually put pressure on the heart and lungs. So surgery can be used both to improve the cosmetic appearance, but also to allow the heart and the lungs to function. So finally, um, getting to um, surgery for cancer care, um, surgery is in fact one of the primary treatment approaches to cancer. Um, when you look at this chart, which is a kind of a representative graph that was, was um, uh, published from the UK, you can see that, um, that surgery as a first line treatment is actually accounts for up to 70% of early stage cancers but only 13% of later stage cancers. So in that early stage, which um, as Sam mentioned, you, um, I think you've all been learning, we hope to catch things early, that surgery can often be done and is associated with often cure. So this is one of the main take home messages of the talk, which is that if surgery can be done, um, if it's possible, it's indicated, it again often provides the best chance for cure from cancer. So I'll just leave that up for a moment. So if it's indicated, it can provide the, the best chance. So how do we decide if it's indicated or if it can be done? These are some of the, some of the things that we have to really evaluate. Um, the first is, is the tumor what we call resectable? And resectable means these are several definitions, either suitable for resection or a tumor that can be managed in part or completely by surgical resection. So what that implies is that the cancer or the tumor can be removed ideally with a rim of normal tissue called the margin. And it can be fully removed with 
acceptable complication profiles and acceptable functional status after surgery. We obviously want to know that there's a proven benefit to surgery as well. And then finally, I've, I've just included something called debulking, which is um, an approach that is occasionally used when the entire cancer or tumor cannot be removed, but it's decreasing the amount of it. And sometimes that can make other treatments um, more um, efficient, more successful. So next I wanted to talk about some trends in surgery for cancer care. Um, the first is less is more. And what I mean by that is that in many types of cancer, what we have found over decades is that um, less invasive or less extensive operations are often associated with very similar outcomes. So we don't need to do these um, sometimes very, uh, very aggressive, very big operations. We're learning we can do less and have the same outcome. So putting on my endocrine surgery hat just for a moment, I'll just um, talk about the, this trend as it relates to endocrine surgery in uh, the 1970s and beyond, um, thyroid cancer was often treated with very large, very long kind of ear to ear incisions. And it involved not just removing cancer, but removing um, structures that um, helped with the cosmetic appearance of the neck and lymphatic drainage and other really important um, functions of the head and the neck. And if we kind of um, compare that, that approach with what we do today, um, we are often now able to use these very, very small incisions that are sometimes three, four centimeters. We kind of try to kind of hide them in natural skin folds so that once they heal, they're very challenging to see. And then of course, we don't kind of remove all of those extra things that used to be um, more commonly removed. So just to, again, review a similar situation in breast cancer surgery, um, there was a very famous surgeon named Dr. Halstead who popularized this approach of surgery where you really did try to remove every possible cancer cell. And that was associated with removal of cancer, but also surrounding muscle, lymph nodes, chest wall, and that similar to that scene with thyroid cancer has over time evolved into much less invasive approaches where um, important structures are preserved and we still get fantastic um, outcomes with reconstruction, with surgery, but, but without um, kind of losing all of that other really important tissue. So the other trend I wanted to briefly discuss is personalized surgical care. Um, so I think many of you may have heard of kind of personalized medicine. Well, we really can think about that the same way um, with decisions around uh, surgery. So I, surgery is not kind of a yes or no, but it's much more nuanced. And I've included here um, two ways in which we use additional information to make decisions around extent, type, and approach in surgery. So the first is um, the molecular or genetic, and I believe that you guys have talked a little bit about this, or we certainly will, um, but this type of information that we're getting about um, either genetic changes in the bloodstream, which are called germline, or genetic changes in the somatic, in the the cancer cells can help us to understand what are the best choices um, for patients? What would we recommend? Um, the second component that I really wanted to highlight is something called discrete choice, which I have really just in the last few years um, kind of understand that it is a method. Um, it's a modeling method that was originally used in economics. It essentially quantifies uh, various preferences that different people consider when they're making a decision. So it's kind of a fancy way of understanding preferences and priorities. And so when you're thinking about surgery, um, people 
hear about complications or cost, or they think about cosmetic concerns, or they think about survival. And those things can mean different things, or they can be in different orders for different, different patients. So what we're, what we're really um, offering is more of a conversation, a moving away from what used to be called kind of this paternalistic approach where you, you, know, you were just kind of told, this is what we're gonna do, to a very collaborative approach, um, especially in situations where there are more than one um, good option. Another trend that's been very important and we're gonna, that's kind of the theme of, I think the evening or one of the themes, and that is that surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy can be combined. Not only can they be combined, but they can be combined in different orders. Um, so here's a, a two more definitions, neoadjuvant treatment. Those are medicines that are administered before surgery. Um, and those can be very helpful to treat early um, cells that have kind of escaped into the bloodstream. It can also kind of shrink the tumor. Um, adjuvant treatment is pharmacological or immunological agent that can be done after surgery that can modify the effect of the other treatment, which is often surgery. So that often comes after. And this is just an example of some different approaches using multimodal care. I just have a you know generic, if you will, cancer. If it's resectable, surgery is often the first line therapy followed perhaps by chemotherapy, depending on the final pathology report. For tumors or cancers that are locally advanced, the neoadjuvant, the treatment before, can sometimes help pre-treat, shrink the tumor, and then allow surgery. And then sometimes if diseases are metastatic or unresectable, um, then sometimes we move just to different types of chemotherapy. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about the multidisciplinary trend in surgery, which is um, just shown here virtually, but it used to be in a room where um, lots of different people with lots of amazing backgrounds would really get together and talk about cases, talk about complex cases, and then come up with um, recommendations. So in conclusion, um, I do again acknowledge surgery can be can be scary, it's invasive, it has risk, but when it's possible, it can often give the best chance for cure. Some of the trends that I talked about included um, less aggressive approaches in surgery, personalized uh, surgical decisions, and multimodal and multidisciplinary approaches. Um, and again, the timing of surgery can be before or after other treatments. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I believe I will be turning it over to Dr. Lauren Beretta, who will be um, giving us some, some information about radiotherapy. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, I believe that this is part of the reason why I'm here. Uh, radiation oncology is a small specialty in which um, uh, you know, we, we are well known within the oncology community, but not as well known through the med medical community overall. So I am really appreciative of the opportunity to, to speak with you all about what we do and our importance in the treatment of cancer. A few learning objectives for us this evening um, to understand the role of radiation in the cancer treatment paradigm, which has already been previewed um, by Dr. Gosnell. Describe the basics of how radiation works against cancer. Describe common indications for palliative radiation, which um, as was mentioned in my intro is an interest of mine. And then introduce various radiation technologies and, and re brief radiation treatment planning. I thought it might be interesting to get into a little bit of the technical aspect of what we do. I'll skip through this, but essentially um, we are a triumvirate of oncologists uh, radiation, surgical, and medical oncology, and we all work to, together to treat the patients in addition with our pathologists, radiologists, and a number of other um, subspecialists involved in, in the care of cancer patients. We often think of radiation as a local regional treatment um, analogous to surgery in that we, you know, we 
our treatments are focused in a specific part of the body in an area um, that either is a potential treatment for cure or for palliation, as opposed to what Dr. Brownfield does, which is systemic treatments that really go from head to toe. So what is radiation? I apologize if anyone just had a flashback to high school science class, but um, radiation is essentially the combined process of emission, transmission, and absor absorption of radiant energy. Um, what we use for therapeutic radiation is on the X-ray and gamma ray spectrum. So very high energy radiation is, is used for therapeutic treatment. What does that actually mean? Um, we are using ionizing radiation to essentially elicit dam DNA damage um, in cancer cells. So um, as I said, we're typically using gamma rays and X-rays or photon-based radiation um, is the majority of what we do. There are also uh, indications to use electrons, um, typically skin cancers or very superficial treatments. You might see a lot about protons um, or carbon ions in uh, the popular media. These are up and coming heavy particle treatments that have a lot of promise. Um, and then there are uh, nuclear isotope treatments. So um, these are kind of a combination of systemic and local uh, radiation therapy treatments administered usually intravenously, um, but with radioactive emitting isotopes. So ionizing radiation, this is high energy um, particle or photon interactions causing double-stranded DNA breaks. Essentially, cancer cells are so um, deranged and deviant that they lack the repair mechanisms of our normal DNA. So the, the, our normal healthy cellular responses to repair DNA damage, cancer cells can no longer do that. And that is um, how we essentially target the cancer cells specifically with our uh, radiation treatments. Now we are learning more and more that in addition to double-stranded DNA breaks, radiation is also altering the uh, local microenvironment of the cancer, including the disrupting the vasculature, inducing local immune responses, um, in addition to a number of other uh, local effects. There are a number of types of radiation, primarily split into external or internal radiation. Majority of what we do is external beam radiation, um, and that's radiation essentially that comes from the outside in. Brachytherapy is the implantation either permanently or temporarily of radioactive seeds into the body. This is essentially a schematic of the insides of a radiation treatment machine, what's called a linear accelerator. I never thought that I would go into a practice where I had to learn about magnetrons and accelerator tubes, uh, but here I am. And um, essentially what happens is uh, this machine generates um, uh, high strength electrons, which are shot down to a, an X-ray target, which then emits photons. And then these photons can actually be shaped and, um, and molded and attenuated if needed before entering the patient. So back in the old days, we'd essentially have rectang rectangular shaped fields, and now we can actually use various different ways. That there's different ways of modulating the beam so that we can create very precise shapes, very irregular shapes, and have very high doses um, to the tumor and very low doses to the neighboring normal tissues. There are uh, a number of different types of linear accelerator machines. We have essentially one of every kind here at UCSF. The, the type of machine can be, is kind of um, specific to what type of cancer we're treating, but I would say the most important part of your radiation treatment is not the machine, but the, the people doing the uh, planning and helping you decide on which treatments to undergo. In addition to the external radiation, we have internal radiation. So this is brachytherapy. Um, this is often used to treat prostate cancers, or gynecologic malignancies. These are um, schematics of radioactive seeds that are implanted into a prostate here. We have hyperthermia, which is the use of uh, um, ultrasound to warm up different parts of the body, which can be used on its own or in combination with standard radiation. We often use this for breast cancers. Intraoperative radiation, um, we often will deliver treatments to a surgical tumor bed on a patient in the operating room. Um, if there are concerns for positive margins for very aggressive cancers like sarcomas. And then at UCSF, we also treat, we do have a specialized proton machine that we just use to treat ocular conditions uh, like ocular melanoma.
radiation oncologists, we do, who are we? We do five years of training after medical school. We do a one-year internship and four years of radiation oncology residency. In addition to being board certified in clinical radiation oncology, we also take radiation biology and radiation physics boards. At UCSF, as with most academic centers, we are all sub or sub sub specialized. So I treat um, diseases of the brain and spine and also uh, uh, I have a palliative practice. You'll, you'll see that people will treat only prostate cancer, only breast cancers, uh, thyroid, head and neck cancers. And we are just part of a, a small part of a large radiation team. Um, we have radiation physicists, radiation dosimetrists and radiation therapists in addition to our nursing and admin staff who uh, essentially help us take care of all of our patients. Because of the inherent risks of treating with radiation, we are a heavily evidence-based uh, practice just as with medical and surgical oncology. These are some of the questions we address at every consultation when we're reviewing the chart in, adv in advance of seeing a new patient. Um, and we often will look to the radiation specific literature to answer these questions. These discussions are, are done um, it, with the input of the rest of the oncology team, uh, as you'll see as part of the tumor boards that we have routinely, as well as with the patient and their family, as uh, Dr. Gosnell had mentioned, you know, we are really trying to make these decisions um, with our patients and in alignment with the goals and preferences of, of patients and their families and sharing the appropriate information in order to, in order to reach uh, these decisions. Because we will be talking a little bit about palliative radiation, I wanted to introduce some common indications for palliative radiation and show you some pictures of uh, uh, treatments that we do on a regular basis. So um, radiation is a, a very good way to relieve pain from bone metastases or cancer that spread to the bone. This is a patient here who had a painful hip metastasis. This is the right hip, right and left are switched here. In addition to causing pain, this was putting the patient at risk for a fracture. So we treated this and, and within a few weeks, the patient had a very good response to treatment. Neurologic compromise from, from brain or spine metastases. So this, um, this is a, a large majority of what I do in a in clinic and a large majority of what um, a lot of radiation oncologists do. So this is a patient that had a large uh, spine metastasis that was causing a lot of pain and some numbness and uh, sensory changes along the rib cage. Um, and we treated this and again, within a few weeks, there was a, a tremendous response in pain. Bleeding from skin or soft tissue masses. So sometimes uh, cancers can erode through the skin. This is a patient with breast cancer who had that problem and had a lot of bleeding. Um, and we treated this and within a month or so that the tumor had regressed um, almost back flat against the chest wall, which was uh, a big improvement in her quality of life. Other indications are difficulty breathing from lung or airway masses and then um, jaundice or uh, bile duct obstruction from blockage of liver pancreas tumors. There are more, but I would say these are the most common indications. Every radiation treatment is personalized. All of these images are from the internet. So these aren't patients that I've treated. I, these are from Google. Uh, but in the process of creating a personalized radiation treatment plan, we often use these immobilization devices to make sure that your specific plan is um, perfect for your anatomy and that every day when you come for treatment, you're lined up um, as precisely as possible. This is a stereotactic head frame that we use for uh, gamma knife radiosurgery or treating cancer that's spread to the brain. This is the most precise kind of radiation that we can deliver and it's something that we do a lot of here at UCSF. This is essentially a, a bean bag that we mold to your body and remove all the air out of and then we can treat um, tumors in the spine, the lung, the abdomen, the chest wall. And this is um, a head and neck mask that actually we use to treat uh, tumors in the neck, the head and neck, um, skull base uh, and upper, um, upper airways. Briefly, I wanted to show you a little bit of what we do in our treatment planning. So part of what, what we do as radiation oncologists is we discuss in detail with our radiology colleagues about what looks like tumor, what's not tumor, um, and that will help us to define our targets in our treatment planning. So this is an example of a patient with a sarcoma of the leg. You can see this um, kind of bright looking or white appearing mass. And this is what we call our gross tumor volume or essentially what is exactly the tumor. 
We often will add a little bit of margin. So Dr. Gosnell touched on margins a little bit. Um, in our case, the margins are more empiric are empirically de um, uh, derived and they encompass the area based on the tumor characteristics that we are think is at risk for microscopic tumor spread. So this is different based on tumor type, based on kind of the genomic features or um, our historical data. And then we also add a little bit of margin because no matter how, how well we align you from day to day, there's always a small, you know, a millimeter or two of wiggling every day when we line you up. So we uh, account for that in our treatment planning process. So we essentially draw these out and then send them to our radiation dosimetrist for, to make the plan. Here's an example of that same process done in a much more complex case. This is a nasopharynx cancer. This is a patient's head. Here's a mouth. Uh, teeth down here. This is the back of the skull, the brain, and the brain stem, and this nasopharynx is right here. This is the area kind of behind your nose and above your the roof of your mouth. And there are multiple different targets, multiple different um, treatment lines, and we're including uh, re regions at risk in, within the lymph node of the neck. So this is an actual treatment plan. These these circular lines here are what we delineated as the volumes that we just described. And then these lines out here are the actual dose with the red line being our target dose of the one we wanted to encompass the whole tumor. This is a patient that I treated with a large melanoma of the underarm. Here's the lungs, the spine, the breastbone. And then this is right under his arm. He had this large mass for melanoma. This was a very simple plan to make. It was essentially a beam in this way and a beam in this way. This one we started kind of emergently um, and it was a, did not take us very long to plan. This is that same nasopharynx case now with the, the treatment dose lines. And you can see it's a much more complicated case. It took us over a week to plan this safely. We have to be mindful of the normal structures in addition to creating our target volume, uh, treating our target to the, to the dose we want. We have to be mindful to avoid spinal cord in this case, um, salivary glands, parotid glands, the oral cavity. And this is what it looks like when you are the patient, you are lying on this treatment table with your immobilization device and this machine rotates around you and delivers the dose. So in summary, radiation therapy is a component of comprehensive oncologic care alongside medical oncology and surgical oncology. Radiation works by damaging DNA of the tumor cells and impacts the tumor vasculature, microenvironment, and the local immune system. Uh, radiation treatment planning can be simple or complex to use for cure or palliation and is always evidence-based and specific to each patient. Um, I hope it was fun to get into the technical details a little bit. I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, but I thought it'd be interesting for this audience. So thank you for your time and I will pass it off to Sam. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beretta, for uh, that terrific summary of radiation and its role in the care for uh, patients with cancer. Um, I'm going to talk to you all for a bit about systemic cancer therapy and I'll define what that means in a bit, um, but this will round out the whole picture of how cancers are uh, often treated, surgery, radiation, and now systemic therapy. So the objectives for my part of this is going to be to be able to list four categories of systemic cancer therapies after we define what systemic therapy is, describe how each category of therapy works, describe some major side effects of each of these categories of treatment, and then to define phase one, two, and three clinical trials. So we'll talk for just a little bit about what clinical trials are and their role in cancer as well. Here's the outline for this talk. We're gonna start by defining some terms. Then we'll talk about four cancer therapies called cytotoxic chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and hormone therapy. We'll go through each of those. Then we'll wrap up with clinical trials and summarize at the end. We'll start with some terms. Systemic therapy, which was in the title of uh, my talk. This is medication given to the whole body to treat cancer. So Dr. Breda and Dr. Gosnell talked to you about ways in which the body can be treated sort of part of the body. If there's a part of the cancer in one part of the body, it can be potentially removed with surgery, treated with radiation. Systemic therapies treat the whole body, assuming that there's cancer in multiple parts in many cases. Systemic therapy can be oral, so pills are a possibility for this type of therapy, or uh, commonly intravenous. 
Systemic therapy can be used curatively, usually combined with radiation or surgery to try to cure a cancer. Or as Dr. Barreto was talking about with radiation, systemic therapy can also be used palliatively, meaning to slow the progression of the cancer when cure is not possible, or to just hopefully make somebody feel better if they've got a lot of cancer in their body. Chemotherapy, a term that many have heard uh, several times, chemotherapy is uh, either used as a general term for all systemic cancer therapy, or more specifically, sometimes it's used to refer to cytotoxic chemotherapy, which we'll come to in a minute. But that term's used often very broadly to describe any systemic cancer therapy. So cytotoxic chemotherapy, a phrase I've mentioned a couple times now, this is sort of what I'll call traditional chemotherapy. Um, it's the oldest form of systemic cancer therapy that we have and it selectively kills cancer cells over normal body cells because cancer cells typically are pro proliferating or multiplying at a faster rate than any other cells in the body. And cytotoxic chemotherapy can select for the cells that are proliferating the fastest. Unfortunately, because of that quality of cytotoxic chemotherapy, this type of therapy also damages non-cancerous cells in the body that proliferate as well. And we'll come back to that. So the other types of systemic cancer therapy include targeted therapy, which is a type of systemic cancer therapy developed specifically to target a particular component of a cancer cell, either on the surface of that cancer cell or even inside of it. And the idea is that the cancer cell uses that target in some way that other cells don't. So that's how the targeted therapy can select for the cancer cells. Immunotherapy is another type of systemic cancer therapy that augments the body's own immune system to find and destroy cancer cells, a relatively new development. And lastly, hormone therapy, the last type of systemic cancer therapy we'll talk about tonight, is a type of therapy that blocks hormone pathways. These hormones might otherwise stimulate the growth of certain types of cancers. So these therapies block that stimulation from those hormones. So we'll come back to each of these types of therapy in turn now in a little more detail. Let's start with just an overview that has a bit of a visual component. I just like to kind of associate pictures with each, each type of therapy to help me remember um, something about it anyway. Cytotoxic chemotherapy I associate with a sledgehammer because it's just a really powerful therapy, um, can be quite toxic and is somewhat selective for cancer cells, but generally we see the most side effects with this type of systemic therapy as compared to the others. Targeted therapy, I think of as sort of a more honed um, dart that seeks out a bullseye on a cancer cell. Immunotherapy is really about the body's immune system. This is a picture of an antibody as part of the body's own immune system. And many immunotherapies actually are themselves antibodies as we will talk a little more about. And then hormone therapy, this is a picture of a teenager that I think of as having hormones, so I remember it that way. So we'll go into each of these in a little bit more detail. Cytotoxic chemotherapy, the sledgehammer. This is what you probably most often would see or think of um, if somebody's visiting an infusion center to get their cancer treatment. Um, in this picture, the chemotherapy is infusing from a bag into an IV as the person sitting in a chair having their cancer treatment infused. And this infusion may take an hour, three hours, something like that, and then they can go home. How is cytotoxic chemotherapy given? Usually intravenously, but there's some oral formulations as I mentioned earlier. The intravenous formulations are usually given once every two to four weeks, depending on what type of therapy it is, sometimes weekly. And if it's an oral therapy, it's usually daily, sometimes with maybe a week break between a couple weeks of taking the pills. So the regimen really depends on which treatment you're talking about. How does cytotoxic chemotherapy work? It generally works by disrupting DNA in some way and thereby disrupting cell replication and preventing otherwise rapidly multiplying cancer cells from multiplying so rapidly. Um, there's lots of different types of cytotoxic chemotherapy. Each of them works a little differently, but that's a just general sense for how they work. When is it used? Cytotoxic chemotherapy is used very broadly in cancer, um, often used to treat stage four or metastatic cancer, as we've talked about in prior sessions, but does have a role in many cases of early stage cancer as well. Again, usually along with either radiation or surgery or both to try to cure the cancer. What are the side effects? Usually in organ systems where cells replicate, for example, in the gut, 
the bone marrow, the hair follicles, which explains why many people on chemotherapy lose their hair, and skin. So those are the organ systems where we most often see side effects from cytotoxic chemotherapy. But other organ-specific side effects may occur, such as in the heart or lungs or kidneys, depending on the type of chemotherapy the person's getting. Examples that you might have heard of, um, these are just a few examples, cisplatin, doxorubicin, Folfox, there's many, many more. So that's um, it on cytotoxic chemotherapy. I'm just going to go through the other types of therapy we mentioned now for a bit. Targeted therapy, how is it given? These are actually usually pills, though there are sometimes intravenous formulations. Again, the pills are usually daily. The IV forms are usually every few weeks. These targeted therapies typically work by blocking some kind of receptor or pathway that is used for cancer cells to grow. So the targeted therapy goes in, blocks some kind of signal and prevents or slows the cancer's growth. These therapies are used across many cancers and the indications for these therapies, the times in which these therapies are used are just growing and growing over time as more research is done. The side effects of these really depend on what the target of the therapy is, but just general themes, commonly we see GI, uh, ga gastrointestinal side effects, and skin rashes. Examples that you may or may not have heard of, osimertinib, bevacizumab, palbociclib. Again, there's many more drug names than these. And in parentheses, I've just indicated that each one of these drugs has a target, and these targets vary depending on what treatment we're talking about. Immunotherapy. This therapy that again augments the body's own immune system is given by IV or injection. Sometimes the therapy can even be directly injected into a tumor itself, but most commonly it's given as an intravenous infusion. Um, there's several types of immunotherapy, but the most common type is called a checkpoint inhibitor. It's a relatively recent development that now has many um, uses in cancer. And I think of this therapy as removing the brakes on the immune system, if we think of the brakes on a car. So it allows the immune system to just run rampant and find and kill cancer cells. It's used in this type, type of therapy used in many different cancers that are very common, including lung cancer, colon cancer, and several others. Melanoma was sort of the original one where these therapies were developed and used. And the side effects, as you can imagine, if you remove the brakes on the immune system are mainly autoimmune side effects, immune or inflammatory side effects in a variety of organs in the body. And many times people don't have side effects from these drugs, but when they do occur, there's a spectrum from mild to quite severe. Examples of these drugs include names like pembrolizumab, nivolumab, dervalumab, and again, there's several others. There are other types of immunotherapy. We talked in a previous session briefly about cancer vaccines, and you'll hear in the final session of this course about a novel therapy called CAR T cells that we're excited to tell you more about. And the last type of therapy I mentioned, hormone therapy. This is uh, usually oral, but there are also injectable forms of hormone therapy. These therapies, again, work by blocking hormone pathways that would otherwise stimulate cancer cells, but if we can block that stimulation, then we can slow down the growth of cancers. These therapies are used in cancers that are driven by hormones, breast cancer, uterine cancer, often driven by estrogen, prostate cancer, often driven by testosterone. So if we can block those hormones, we can block that stimulatory signal to the cancer. The side effects from these are mainly hormone related and often come in the form of hot flashes, mood symptoms, and sexual side effects. Examples of drugs you might have heard of, tamoxifen, letrozole, luprolide. Again, there's several others. So that was a brief overview of four different types of systemic cancer therapies. And I wanna talk briefly about clinical trials and then I'll wrap up and move us on to our tumor board. Clinical trials, I just have one slide on. I'll mention that clinical trials are, um, are, re are research studies that help find ways to improve health. So that's a very broad term and can be used across uh, medicine, not only in cancer, but clinical trials are common in cancer. Importantly, clinical trials are voluntary and require informed consent. Those are key terms. Everyone participating in a clinical trial has to volunteer to do it. No one can be forced to do it and they have to have informed consent. They have to be fully informed about the clinical trial 
and with all that information in mind, have to decide to participate. Trials are used to compare treatments, sometimes to compare treatments to placebos, which are um, sort of fake treatments used in trials for the purpose of proving that a treatment actually works better than no treatment. And some, some trials don't have any comparison at all. They're just testing a treatment. Typically, participants in clinical trials are compensated for their time that they're spending in the trial. There are three types of clinical trials just to hear about. Um, the first one is called a phase one clinical trial. These tr trials answer the question, is it safe? Is the treatment safe? Usually fewer than 25 people participate in these types of trials. And phase one trials look at treatment safety. They look at what dose of the treatment is best and are there side effects at different doses of the treatment. Phase two clinical trials answer the question, does the treatment work? These are medium-sized trials, usually 100 people or less, and they treat people who have the disease rather than healthy participants. In phase one, either healthy participants or uh, people who have the disease and are sort of in their, have, have been through many other types of therapy and are just looking for a, a, another one that they could try, um, try phase one trials. Phase two is larger groups of people who have the disease. And these trials look at whether the treatment works um, and what the side effects are. And then if a drug gets through phase two trials and looks effective and safe, then phase three trials answer the question, does this treatment work better than what's currently available to people who have this disease? These trials are larger, usually several hundred people or more, and they compare treatments um, to either what the current treatment is or again to placebo, a sort of fake treatment, if there's not a great treatment already out there. So that was a brief uh, thing about clinical trials. I just put this uh, history sort of uh, evoking picture in there to remind me to comment that historically, um, what were called clinical trials in some instances have resulted in major distrust of the medical community um, with incidents like Nazi Germany and Tuskegee, where people were um, horribly mistreated in the context of what was called uh, clinical research. Nowadays, it's really important, again, to emphasize that trials are voluntary and that patients have fully informed consent, that they really know what they're getting themselves into um, so that we as a medical community can hopefully uh, rebuild some trust that's been historically lost. So take home points from, th from this talk. Systemic cancer therapy treats cancer throughout the body rather than a specific site of cancer in the body as surgery and radiation do. There are multiple types of systemic cancer therapy that each work in different ways. It's common to combine different types of cancer therapy into a single regimen so that the cancer has a hard time persisting in the body. For example, combining surgery and radiation and chemotherapy or combining chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So there's a lot of different combinations that are out there. And lastly, clinical trials test treatments to see if they benefit people with cancer so that those treatments can then be widely used. All right, so that is uh, it on systemic therapy. And now I wanna transition us into our mock tumor board. Um, I'm gonna invite all of our participants now to um, turn off or turn on their cameras so that you can uh, see all of us, Dr. Baer, Dr. Beretta, myself, Dr. Gaznal, and Dr. Newman. And I'm gonna introduce uh, what a tumor board is briefly, and then we'll go ahead and get started with it. So a tumor board is a gathering of professionals in different areas of medicine. Typically, people like you're seeing tonight will gather together, uh, a surgeon, a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist, a radiologist, and a pathologist, and possibly others, to discuss a complex case to figure out what the best way forward is to treat somebody's cancer. Um, the case we're going to discuss tonight, I'll mention a few caveats. Number one is we've changed some of the details of the case to make sure that it's not an identifiable person. Um, and number two is that this case is not typically, this case is not as complex as a typical case that would be discussed in tumor board. We wanted to keep things relatively straightforward for the purposes of this audience um, so we don't lose you. Um, and last caveat is that uh, in tumor boards, we typically refer to each other by our first names because it's a private gathering and we're, we all kind of are collegial and know each other. So we'll be doing that, but don't take it as a sign of us disrespecting each other or anything. Uh, you probably won't hear us call each other by doctor um, as we uh, chat. So I'll go ahead and advance uh, to start this tumor board. And for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, uh, we will kind of let you in on what this looks like behind the curtain when we're trying to figure out how to take care of somebody with cancer. So I think uh, Jess has a case for us tonight. 
Great. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone, again. So I wanted to um, present a case. Um, this is a 60-year-old woman that I saw in my clinic, very active, excellent performance status, um, who was otherwise um, healthy, um, no other uh, relevant medical problems or surgical problems, um, but noticed with, um, with the family that um, she had this rapidly growing thyroid mass and also began to notice some difficulty swallowing. So um, she had um, an evaluation. She had um, a number of uh, x-rays, including ultrasound and CT scans and had a biopsy. So Spencer, I would love if we could review some of the imaging and then um, Neil have a look at the pathology. Sure, uh, thank you, Jess. I'm gonna start off with showing the images from our diagnostic thyroid ultrasound. So these images is just show select image showing the large heterogeneous mass all throughout that. Um, the imaging features are very suspicious and uh, cued us to perform a diagnostic uh, a FNA through it. This shows the needle going through it. This is where we use the ultrasound and uh, guided the needle into the thyroid for um, pathology to review, which Neil will present after I go through the rest of those images. And then I saw she also had some uh, CT images, which we can talk show next. So these are, she has CT, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis. Um, the CT of the neck shows this large mass. So this is the mass that we're seeing on the ultrasound. So these are the coronal vaginal and uh, axial reformats showing this is the large mass in the central neck and extending quite high, which is probably explaining why she's developing those symptoms of uh, difficulty breathing. And then going on to the next images, showing the CT images, some select images from the CT chest. So we've taken these wind and made them into lung windows that show had multiple pulmonary nodules in, in both in the left lung, and there's some on the right too as well, which are suspicious. Uh, this would be pretty suspicious for our pulmonary metastasis. I didn't put any images from the abdomen pelvis in here because I didn't see any abnormalities to suggest metastatic disease. I think, you know, um, I think Neil's up next with some, uh, he's got some of the images from uh, discussion of pathology. Uh, thanks so much, Spencer. So for the uh, thyroid fine needle aspiration that Spencer showed you, uh, we're top lining this uh, epithelioid and spindle cell malignancy with chondrosarcomatous differentiation. And I'll walk you through how we arrived at uh, that diagnosis. So we take the um, fine needle aspirate and we put it onto a slide and then we stain, as I mentioned uh, in a previous lecture. And then in the middle here, you can see this, the patient sample. And sort of what you're seeing here is um, a couple things. First, there's we have an adequate sample, so that means we got the lesion. Uh, the second is that you're seeing sort of these two-tone pink um, within the sample, and the, the dark pink is the uh, blood, and then the light pink is actually where some of our tumor is. And um, in one of the boxes, you can actually see these sort of scattered black dots, so we actually know that this is a highly cellular sample. And then in one of the other uh, portions, you can actually see these sort of light gray uh, to bluish um, fragments, and that's actually uh, part of the tumor as well, which is you know abnormal to see uh, in the thyroid. So we'll we'll go on to the next slide. And here, when we zoom into those black boxes, you can see the characteristic features of, um, of this tumor. So in the second panel here, you're seeing um, one, we wanna see if it's benign or malignant. In the second panel, you can see these very large cells that are very dark and big and also pleomorphic, meaning they have lots of variable sizes and shapes. And you can see those with the black arrows. And then you can compare that to a normal cell, uh, which is with the blue arrow at the bottom. So you can see these cells are much bigger uh, than they should be. So this is indicating it's a malignant process. In the third panel, uh, we can then sort of get a little bit more into what type of tumor this is. So we can see in the bracket on the top left of the third panel, you can see this collection of cells indicating it's epithelial, um, meaning it's sort of cells sticking together. And that's an epithelioid tumor. And then further, you can see these with the arrows in the third panel, you see these sort of spindled shaped cells that are sort of tapered at both ends. And those are also the tumor cells. So we call those spindle cells. 
And then finally, um, the fourth and last panel, those sort of blue gray fragments that we were seeing at low power, when you zoom in on them, you can actually see um, it's, um, it's called chondrosarcomatous. And this is a, um, basically it's, it's producing cartilage matrix like you would see in your, in your joints, um, but this is highly atypical for a uh, tumor to be producing this. And so this is chondrosarcomatous. And then we can do some immunohistochemistry to further evaluate um, this tumor sample. So on the top row, you can see the patient sample. And on the, on the bottom, you can see the positive controls to make sure our sample, our, our staining is working appropriately. So the first two stains we did were PAX8 and TTF1. Those are typically what we would use to identify uh, that this lesion is, in fact, from the thyroid, uh, but they're both negative in this case, as you can see from the staining, and that's actually characteristic of the tumor uh, that we have here. Next, on the third panel, we have calcitonin, which is uh, negative in this case as well, and we use this to see if this tumor could actually be something called a medullary carcinoma, another very aggressive thyroid tumor, so it's negative, indicating it's not that tumor. Uh, then the fourth panel we have here is the KI67. It's a marker for how proliferative this tumor is. So how many how much the tumor is, um, um, you know, how mitotically active it is, uh, how much it's dividing. You can see it's, there's a lot of brown dots here indicating it's highly mitotically active at about 60%. And then next on the, the two panels on the right, we tested for um, the BRAF V600E mutation by immunohistochemistry, as well as the PANTRAC mutation. Uh, and those are, um, those are both negative, indicating they do not have those mutations. And so finally, in conclusion, based on the histology, what, so what we're seeing under the microscope, it can be uh, one of two things. Um, one is anaplastic thyroid carcinoma with chondrosarcomatous differentiation, or um, uh, because of the chondrosarcomatous portion, it could be a sarcoma of the soft tissue or the larynx uh, in there. However, when we put everything together, uh, based on the histology, the imaging, and the immunohistochemistry, the features support a diagnosis of anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, uh, which has also been called undifferentiated carcinoma of the thyroid. And we have sent the sample that's been provided for uh, the next generation molecular sequencing through our UCSF 500 panel, as well as another panel called Tempest XT, and those results are still pending. Thanks so much. Thanks, Neil, and um, thanks, Spencer. Um, I, um, you know, given the metastases that we're seeing in the lungs, given the pathology, and given just this local invasion that I'm seeing or local advancement, um, I'm, I am concerned that this is unresectable. Um, so I'm wondering if we should now maybe just talk about systemic therapy. Sam, what are, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, thanks, Jess. I, I totally agree. I think in this case, I would favor um, chemotherapy with carboplatin and paclitaxel um, because it seems like this tumor is rapidly progressive. Um, and the fact that we can't use targeted therapy because there's no BRAF or TREC mutations to target. Um, there's also newer data supporting the use of immunotherapy along with the chemotherapy um, in a case like this. So I recommend adding pembrolizumab to the regimen. Um, we can ordinarily use iodine therapy to treat some forms of thyroid cancer, as you all know, but this form, anaplastic thyroid cancer, unfortunately doesn't respond to iodine therapy because that type of cancer, those cells have lost the ability to uptake iodine as most thyroid cells can do. So we can't use iodine therapy to treat that cancer. Um, Lauren, do you see a role for uh, radiation in this case? What a difficult case. Um, I agree that, you know, with the, with the local invasion and the metastasis that um, curative intent treatment is off the table. So any treatment from my perspective would be palliative intent. Um, uh, often these tumors cause a lot of distress um, from the patient perspective with regard to uh, compression of the airways and the esophagus or the swallowing tube. So um, there can be a role for radiation in, in treating the primary tumor to help um, slow the, slow the growth, and growth and maybe alleviate some of the um, compression. The radiation doesn't have to be given upfront and with the metastatic disease, I, I think I worry about delaying the systemic therapy to give palliative radiation. Um, so I, I, um, I think it would be reasonable to start with 
Sam, with the systemic therapy that you outlined and then reassess the response. And um, I would be happy to discuss further with the patient and their family what their goals of treatment and, and um, uh, hopes would be. Thanks, Lauren. And thanks everybody for your um, input in this case. Um, I'll just go ahead and summarize the tumor board recommendations and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so it sounds like we're gonna recommend systemic therapy with a combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy to start off with um, as we wait for that UCSF 500 molecular testing to come back. Um, we didn't find any targets for targeted therapy initially and it's unlikely we will on this further testing, but we'll see if anything shows up. So we'll gauge the response of the, system to, of the tumor to the systemic therapy. Um, it sounds like unfortunately this cancer is not resectable and palliative radiation, though, may have a role maybe later on after the systemic therapy is started, and we've seen what the response is like to that. Um, do we all agree with that or anything else to add? All right. Well, thanks, everybody, again, for your contributions in this tumor board. And we will um, end our mock tumor board there. Um, and for the audience, um, so that was a, an example, sort of, a, I would say, a, a simplified version of what tumor board conversations are typically like. Often there's some, uh, uh, there's a case where there's not really good um, evidence for what to do, and there's discussion that's very nuanced between different specialists about what therapy may be best to try in a situation where there's not a great, uh, clear answer. Um, but we wanted to at least show you a bit about what this can look like. So I'll go ahead and transition us now into our uh, Q&A session. Um, so we have one question in the Q&A. Um, the question is, would you do surgery after chemotherapy ever, um, later on maybe? Um, and then a second part of that is, um, is there ever a palliative surgery? So I'm thinking maybe we'll focus on the first part of that question. Would you ever do surgery after chemotherapy and see if Jess might be able to give us an answer to, um, to that? So it's a great question, and I think um, you know the, the 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 short answer is is yes. We actually um, we actually do that, and I think that um, I think it's a really important point is that making one choice doesn't mean that we don't then have those other options as choices later on, depending on the response. So um, sometimes treatment with chemotherapy or systemic therapy or radiotherapy can actually um, make what is what we, th we think of as unresectable resectable. And we're able to um, you know, spare a lot of, of complications um, by doing it in that sequence so that we don't just go in there and try to, to do surgery and remove things that we really need for function. So um, I don't know if others wanna kind of add in any other comments. Yeah, that's, that's terrific. And I'll just say from the medical oncology standpoint, as someone who gives chemotherapy, um, Jess taught us about the term neoadjuvant, and that's exactly what this is referring to, the idea of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that you would give chemotherapy before surgery. And as Jess was saying, that strategy is used in several types of cancer. So I give neoadjuvant chemotherapy often, um, sometimes in conjunction with radiation, even before surgery for esophageal cancers, um, for rectal cancers. So there's several examples where that strategy is, is definitely used. Um, the second part of that question was asking about whether there's ever a, a palliative surgery. Um, Jess, is that ever a thing? Yeah, yeah, it actually is. Um, the things that come to mind, um, remember I, I showed a slide of a bowel obstruction. Um, so there are, there are cases where, there, um, where we're not able to um, remove all of the tumor per se, but if there's an obstruction, we are sometimes able to do kind of palliative um, bowel resections or um, operations to restore um, the function of the intestines, even though the intent of that operation is not to cure the cancer, it's to um, improve symptoms. And so there's several examples when that can be you know, very, very successful in terms of um, improving quality of life, et cetera. Thanks, Jess. I have a, a question for Lauren. Um, it's a, a tough question um, that I think we all could probably um, have slightly different answers to, but when the word palliative is used, 
does that mean that someone is not likely to survive cancer? Is that how we use the word palliative? Well, that's a great question. And I'd be very interested to hear what you all think as well. Um, uh, I think historically we use the term palliative or palliation to describe symptom directed treatments in patients with metastatic or terminal cancers, incurable cancers. Um, I think that that line is blurring a little bit more now with patients with stage four cancers living longer and longer with uh, developments in, in systemic therapies in particular. And, um, you know, there are patients that live kind of long, normal lifespans, even with um, metastatic cancers. So um, I, I tend to use the word palliative as a, as a way to describe a symptom directed treatment rather than a curative intent treatment. Um, but I, I would not say necessarily that that has a direct relation to um, survivability. Um, but I, I agree there, there is a, it is kind of a blurry and uh, evolving space. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Lauren. I think for me, the, the word palliative has kind of evolved in meaning a little bit over time. I think when people said palliative in the past, often they were referring exclusively to end of life care. And now, Lauren, I, I use it pretty much like you do pretty synonymously with just helping people with symptoms. And that often is toward the end of life, but often it's not. Um, you can help someone with symptoms when they have very curable um, cancer. Um, though I will say we, we often do use the term palliative to also mean not curative when we're talking about what's the intent of our therapy. We talk about curative intent therapy with the goal of curing someone or palliative intent therapy with the goal of not curing but helping someone feel better as best we can and potentially live as long as they can with cancer. So very good and complicated question with complicated answers. Um, I don't know if others have other thoughts about that too. I so agree with both both of you, Lauren and Sam. I I think it's such a loaded word, and I think that that people when they hear that they have a a, a set of connotations, and those could be true, but it can often just mean that symptom relief. So I almost feel like this is probably an area where we need another word. We need another way of describing things so that so that it doesn't, I think, um, give people this expectation. And I'll just give one example. Um, I think, yeah, Neil, you brought up medullary thyroid cancer, and that is an example where it's actually very, very challenging to get a biochemical cure, meaning no cancer cells are like making calcitonin, which is the little tumor marker. Um, you know, but having watched people raise their children and live for decades and all of what we do is palliative, but it's helping them to, you know, live, live their best lives with this, with this biology. So I, I agree. It's kind of nuanced. Maybe Spencer, I'll ask you this next question. Um, and others may have thoughts too. Um, the person is asking, do all cancer cases go through tumor board? No, well, I mean, I think the vast majority do not. I think there are select cases in which the multidisciplinary discussion is essential for our decision making. Um, I mean, I would defer to Jess and, and you to what cases would you tailor it down. Sometimes, you know, specifically for staging and decision at upfront, um, a lot of our GU cases like prostate cancer will go through just to decide whether it goes to radiation surgery or oncology. Uh, but yes, a lot of them do not. A lot of the cases just, you know, they come and the decision is made. But it, it's such a question that have the, the questions that go out to the team. Yeah, Jess, go ahead, please. Oh no, I I, I was going to defer to you. I I think um, it's also a great question. Um, I agree with Spencer in that there are probably selected cases. There are also various reasons that that I want to discuss patients in this forum we've kind of focused on like, what is the treatment recommendation? But sometimes I have a question that's much more, um, you know, it's more to Neil, like, can you walk me through this diagnosis histologically? Or sometimes it's more for Spencer, like, okay, I, I think the patient would benefit from surgery, but I need to understand this anatomy. And so mm -hmm. I think it's, it's cases where there's a question either on treatment or on the diagnostics or on the pathology or you're introducing that patient to the team. Um, so 
I think it depends on the, the clinical question. It also, um, sometimes it can just depend on timing and interaction. Some people have a very similar multidisciplinary clinic. So this same type of discussion can happen in a clinic, um, just kind of real time. So I think there are lots of different, lots of different approaches. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll just add that um, if we did bring every case of cancer to tumor board, that tumor board would be um, endless. Uh, so we are, I think as a group, pretty selective about which cases we bring to tumor board. And as I mentioned, um, cases where the treatment is pretty straightforward or well-defined, usually those cases don't require tumor board input. It's usually just the cases where the path forward is not entirely clear that are brought to tumor board. And thanks to research and clinical experience, in many cases, the path forward is quite clear. So tumor board discussion is not, uh, not needed. All right, uh, several other questions in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, so referring to the case we just discussed, would the team make different decisions, or maybe even a, a, in general, would the team make different decisions if a patient were older, or if they had more comorbidities, um, or is cost taken into account, or the patient's wishes? I, I wonder, maybe we'll go to Jess, because you presented this case, and just thinking about, let's say this case were of an of older person, older than the person presented. Does that change how you're thinking about anything here? Yeah, I mean, I think these are when I was um, when I was talking in my little section on kind of personalized medicine, that that's embedded in that. It it isn't it doesn't just mean DNA testing and somatic testing. It means um, you know kind of treating each patient in their own unique situation and trying to obviously understand the biology and understand what recommendations are but then contextualizing that with pers the person's, not just their chronologic age, but like their other medical problems, their frailty, if you will, um, their, obviously their wishes. Um, you know, I, I guess just to, just to mention, I don't think cost is something that I certainly, um, I'm, I'm very uh, agnostic to that when I'm talking to patients, but everything else is, you know, it's a lot of discussion. Yeah, and I think probably each of us has our own uh, perspective from the kind of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy end of things about how age and comorbidities are factored in, but the considerations are pretty similar. Um, in general, a younger, healthier person is better able to go through surgery and radiation and chemotherapy, whereas an older person who is very frail and has a lot of other illnesses we, we definitely do take that into account when we're thinking about what treatments are appropriate. And that does sometimes get discussed at tumor board as well. Um, I see a question about how, mu how much would you discuss frailty at tumor board? And I think just to tack that on, because we sort of touched on it already, that frailty um, is certainly discussed both in and outside of tumor board when we're thinking about what treatments are appropriate. We even have some measurements around frailty. Can we tell how frail someone is, how likely they are to tolerate a treatment okay or, or not well? So that certainly is a really important consideration for I think all of us here when we're thinking about therapy for cancer. Can I add one thing, Sam? Sure. Yeah, I was just gonna add for, for surgery, there are actually um, some very useful um, quantifiable little calculators that people can actually, that we, that you can use in kind of um, in discussion with surgeons about based on um, medical problems, age issues, it kind of gives you a sense of what are outcomes that are similar with other people that have those same characteristics. So that's really important because um, if there's a high risk of, say, with surgery, you know, have, being in the intensive care unit for a long time, um, you know, that's something that, that people need to kind of think through for themselves. And so there are um, quantifiable ways that we try to help kind of talk about those issues and what the results could be for, for patients. Thanks, Jess. There's a couple of questions coming up for uh, Lauren. I'm going to tackle one quickly and then 
two in a row for Lauren. Um, so someone was asking about any details about bladder cancer, causes, treatments, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, in this course, we haven't had a chance to dive deeply into um, many types of cancer. We've really focused on the most common ones. Bladder is um, not among the very most common, but certainly is uh, not rare, rare. Um, so I'll just talk for one minute about it just um, to let people know a little info. So bladder cancer, uh, most of the time we don't know what causes bladder cancer. Most of the time it's just a random event um, to our knowledge. Um, there are some risk factors like smoking increases the risk and some um, infections that are mostly rare in the United States, but present in other parts of the world can be risk factors as well. Um, in general, uh, as Jess mentioned, same applies in the bladder. If a bladder cancer can be resected, it typically should be resected as, as a major part of treatment. Bladder cancer is another case where neoadjuvant chemotherapy is commonly used, chemotherapy before um, resection of the cancer. Um, sometimes, uh, if it's not safe um, or to remove the bladder, often removing the whole bladder is required for surgical treatment of bladder cancer. There are non-surgical treatments using chemotherapy and radiation to try to spare the bladder um, and just treat the, the cancer to try to cure it um, without removing the bladder. So there's some different treatment options. And then when bladder cancer is metastatic or stage four, like most cancers, the primary treatments are systemic and are usually either cytotoxic chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So that's just brief information on bladder cancer. And sorry, not enough time to go into that much detail on this or uh, some other types of cancer uh, tonight. I wanna jump to a couple questions for Lauren. Um, I am gonna read this one uh, and we'll probably get the acronyms wrong. Um, I was at Slack once and heard someone talking about using LINAC, which I remember Lauren talking about for radiotherapy. Do people actually get treated with that huge machine? What a great question. My understanding is no, they don't get treated with that machine. That machine is primarily for research. Um, but they do a lot of translational research, meaning taking their um, kind of basic science accelerator research and, and, and translating it into the patient care space. Most recently, they've been working on something called flash radiation therapy, which is an emerging technology using very high doses delivered very quickly to alter um, the tumor microenvironment, the DNA, all within a matter of seconds, um, which is really exciting and a, and a um, a very active area of research and, and essentially developing it on the um, big linear accelerator and then testing it in patients on, on clinically built systems. Thanks, Lauren. So this next question, um, Lauren, can you talk about developments over the past few decades in radiation that have, that have helped to reduce negative outcomes? Sure, so um, thanks for sharing your, um, your story. Um, there's a, a, I would say there's a few things. One, with radiation in particular, um, the newer technologies have allowed us to be certainly more precise with our targeting um, and uh, reducing dose to normal surrounding structures. That's probably number one. Um, so a lot of our um, kind of unintended side effects have, have improved quite a bit over the past two decades. Um, the other big change that's happened is, you know, systemic therapy has gotten so much better um, that we're often um, treating smaller tumors in the cases of uh, lymphomas and in particular, systemic therapy has really decreased the volume of, of cancer cells that we have to treat. So lower volume um, overall and then smaller targets from, from, uh, from our own technologic advances. So it's really, I think the advancement of a field as a whole has allowed us to all have better outcomes um, which is why we love being oncologists. Thanks, Lauren. Um, this is a big question. What would be some good questions to ask if someone is diagnosed with cancer? Um, we talked a bit about diagnosis and cancer um, last week. Um, I'll just kind of uh, briefly say that it'd be good to, to know about what type of cancer it is, what the stage is, and what the treatment options are. Um, those are kind of the big questions I have in my mind. Um, does anyone else on the panel have any thoughts about maybe one other good question to ask um, after a cancer diagnosis? I was just going to add, um, I think with the internet, there is a lot of information and um, I think, you know, trying to ask folks that can lead 
lead you to good sources of information um, would be really important, like either using um, national organizations or um, academic centers, but not just Dr. Google. Uh, I think that that can help quite right. a bit and help that will help you kind of develop questions, I think. Yeah, I was going to build on that and just say there's a lot of patient support groups that really is like, you know, with forums that they can delve into that can help too. I, I think that's the, I've, when I treat patients that um, with my systemic therapy, there's something that they all come in they're like, oh yeah, I already talked to five different people that have gone through this therapy. So, um, or they get to know about the different therapies and how to prep them. I'll comment quickly on this question about, um, I, hearing about trials seems to place so much hope um, when people are referred to them. Is that realistic? Um, I do think trials do offer a lot of hope in some scenarios. It really just depends on what type of trial we're talking about. Um, but I, I would say in general, trials uh, are an excellent source of hope. And some people have very successful outcomes on them. Unfortunately, many don't. And it's really hard to know how it will go for any individual until they, they try it. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you so much to our speakers and panelists tonight for joining us. Hope you enjoyed this mock tumor board, and we will look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.